Next, next hour, we're going to have a conversation about plan, plan for the future. What's the plan for those who are in grade 7 today or those who are in grade 8 today? The, the plan is to go to grade 9 next, next year. year. After grade 9, the plan is to go to? Grade 10. And the grade 10 is no longer a junior secondary. No, it's senior. It is now senior. Secondary. What are all these things that we're talking about? Mm -hmm. It's because we're running out the curriculum competency-based curriculum. The person who is in charge of rolling out this curriculum and seeing the curriculum development in the country is Professor Charles Ongondo. He is the CEO of the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development, KICD. Prof, good morning. Good morning. Welcome and, uh, to the hot seat of the situation. The situation room. Karibu sana. Asante. To welcome you to the conversation, the man who's planning to head to the Maldives in five years' time <laughs> had made a plan previously and he succeeded. He went to a country in uh, the southern parts of this continent and he has brought up proverbs. So you listen to his proverb. He'll tell us which country. It listen the, to the proverb. Yes. And then you'll give us your interpretation of it, Prof. It's the kingdom mm. of Swatini. Mm -hmm. Well, previously people knew it as Swaziland. Mm. That changed. Okay? Now, the proverb. A man who says it cannot be done should not interrupt the man doing it. A man who says that it cannot be done should not interrupt the man who's doing it. Mm. Professor Amond, I'm sure this one applies very well to you. Clearly. <laughs> What's the interpretation of it? <laughs> yes, because... We want to be where the rest of the giants of the world are. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only thing that can get us there is a relevant curriculum. Mm -hmm. And uh, definitely we shall have challenges uh, getting to be alongside the best. But it has to be done. And uh, those of us who are doing it should not be told not to do it. So very <laughs> applicable. That's the thing about proverbs. Yeah. They never die. They never die. No. They remain strong. And as long as it's African, it can be applicable in any other African context. Okay. Yeah. Karibu Sana Prof. Already people are saying they are students and they are saying hello to you. I'm sure you've met with one oh, of yes, the students yes, walking yes. out. Yeah. I'm strong. He's already saying. I spent. Uh, you taught me at Moy. <laughs> <laughs> I spent 16 years uh, teaching at Moy University. And. Uh, among the departments where I taught was the Department of Communication Studies, where we were uh, facilitating people who had interests in being journalists. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure a number of them are here. And one of the things that will always make you happy is to meet someone, they shake your hands and they say, you are my teacher. Mm. Mm. Gives a great pride. Oh, yes, it does. Mm? Mm, it does. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it certainly does. In fact, Makes your day. <clears throat> it actually beats anything else that you may have done. Yeah. Mm. Just someone, yes. tell, and they'll tell you things that you've probably forgotten about. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yes. Uh, they'll tell you the jokes you made. Mm. <laughs> they'll tell you a few times they thought you were very hard on them. Mm. Mm. <laughs> the, t the moments you had carried them when they were very low. Right. Uh, but the f just the feeling that they made it and that you made a contribution to it mm. is very energizing. Okay. I can tell you. Let's talk about CBC, yes. competence-based curriculum. We've had conversations here a number of times before. When we've asked ourselves, all right, so we are changing the curriculum. We are changing the curriculum. Are we improving on the current, on the previous curriculum, or are we overhauling the curriculum, or what are we doing to the curriculum? In fact, CT's always the question he asks is, what was wrong with the other one exactly? And why are we changing it? I'm sure you are involved in the conversation that brought us to the CBC. Yes. What is the thinking? Uh, very, very good questions. And I'm very grateful that you brought me here to be able to talk about some of those issues because uh, we are not changing the curriculum because there was anything wrong with the previous one. Uh, it's not even correct to say you're overhauling the curriculum. We are reviewing and review is a constant part of human life to be consistent with the changing times. I'm sure that even here, and if we say in the spectrum of journalism generally, a lot of things have changed in response to a lot of things that are also changing around us. So basically we are reviewing the curriculum. What we had served us, still serves us, but there are moments then you take a step back and you look at what you are offering and you say, how can we improve? So of all the terminologies that you used, uh, Latte, I will mm. take improvement is the word. Mm. Yes. Improve the curriculum. Yeah. 
Well, uh, Prof, you are among the very few people who actually use the term. You see, the question arises from statements that are probably made not by professionals like you, but purveyors of politics who have entered the education space. Mm -hmm. And they talk of it as being new, and you're asking, mm. what exactly is new? Mm -hmm. That's where the question arises from. Yeah. And then they seek to implore you to understand yeah. that apart from it being new, <coughs> it's going to bring about all these changes. And you're asking the question, the previous one that we, you say we had, did it not also promise the same mm -hmm. and also, also bring forth the same? So then you ask the all eternal question. Yeah. So what really is new? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, CT. And, and that puts us in the right trajectory, in my view, because let's start from the question. Mm. What is our curriculum? Before we can even talk about what's new about it. Mm. Basically, we are talking about all those learning experiences that learners in the space of the school system will be exposed to, to enable them acquire basically four things. The knowledge that is required of them, the skills, the attitudes, and the values. Now, this is what we package in one word called competencies. Mm -hmm. uh, and those experiences that learners are exposed to in the school system can be looked at in three ways. Mm -hmm. There is the formal, which is what most of us talk about. In fact, when we talk about CBC, a lot of us are just focusing on what is on pen and what is on paper to be covered on a Monday or a Tuesday in the term in the year. But there is also the non-formal. Mm -hmm. And then there is the informal. Mm. Now, all these experiences are geared towards, now we have agreed we shall use the word competencies. Mm -hmm. What competencies do we want to give our learners? But a bigger question is, what do you want the country to do with the competencies? What competence does the country need? So just to get back to City's question on what is new. Um, what is new, largely, mm. will be that we realize there are certain aspects of knowledge, there are certain skills, there are certain competencies that this country requires that currently we are not offering our learners in the manner that they require. That's one. Mm -hmm. Two, you think about the way in which we offer that, the experiences I talked about. Uh, in, in, in academic terms, we call it pedagogy, but we basically talk about learning and teaching experiences, learning and teaching methods. You might even add there uh, teaching, I mean, assessment uh, methods. Mm -hmm. So then you look at what we have and you say, look, this seems to have served us, mm -hmm. but we need a new way of offering these experiences. And the last bit then is um, we have been dealing with a certain set of values. Uh, these have served us to an extent, but there are still gaps that probably require that we are exposing our learners to a different set of values. So yes, what is new is that there will be some new content, so to speak. Mm. There will be some new approaches to offering that content to learners mm. <coughs> and uh, new sets of values. Uh, probably not entirely new, but you look at what you've been offering and you say there is a gap here that requires that we put more emphasis. So the newness mm. could be on the emphasis uh, that you are placing on a particular matter. And if you allow me to just get into this, just to you know reiterate what you said, uh, take the area of language, uh, which you guys are very familiar with, and I mention that because uh, I'm a teacher of language, basically. Uh, the, the parts of speech will largely remain the same. <laughs> Adjectives, <laughs> verbs, nouns, pronouns. Mm. So then the question you ask is, what is new? What is new is, what do we want our learners to do with our language? And therefore, what content do we give emphasis? Okay. How do we offer them? How do we assess to be able to realize that these people can demonstrate that they are able to apply that knowledge in the workspace? Okay. So then from, from what I gather from what you're saying now, is that nothing was being overhauled per se, <clears throat> and nothing incredibly new was being introduced but that there are improvements being mm -hmm. made and that there are gaps, essentially, yeah. that are being filled. Yeah. And what we are trying to do with learners today mm -hmm. is then be able to see how they apply these mm -hmm. concepts that mm -hmm. they are being taught. Is that the reason then now why we see a lot more activity around learning? 
which a lot of times parents have complained about that they're then being pulled into this whole circus of having to mm -hmm. you know assist i already see it it's 80 percent student or learner based and then 20 percent mm -hmm. parent assisted mm -hmm. is that why we then see this increased flurry of activity especially then uh, in the lower to uh, upper primary Exactly. You've put it so well. In fact, I, I started wondering why you invited me here. You would have talked about this. <laughs> 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 uh, and it's important that we demystify this to the country, that uh, we are not saying everything that was 844 is bad. Throw it away into the dustbin. Mm. And if you go further, because you had asked me to talk about even pre-independence uh, and so on, we are not mm. saying that everything even was there before it, uh, that 844 was bad throw it away. Mm. I can't put it in better words than Drew has put it. That we are saying, hang on, in 1982, when we last decided on the set of subjects we shall offer our learners, we may have missed out emphasis on environmental studies. Mm. Okay, just mm -hmm. an example. Mm -hmm. We may have missed out emphasis on science or we package that science in a way that we were just looking at learners recalling what they were taught in class mm. or there are issues we now know about science that we did not know then that are relevant to bring to the picture mm. and then coming to what Ndu is saying uh, one of the big things we realize the gaps is that over years we have zeroed into just one approach to learning assessment mm. and if you get a from that assessment you are a clever person you go to university and <laughs> you employ you here then we discover that actually you don't have the competence is required mm. so then we say there must be a new way of assessing our learners but let us not wait for that new way of assessing them let us introduce sets of programs activities experiences mm. that involve other people around the child also mm -hmm. hence uh, what Ndu is saying that now we are even saying uh, can we have even parents getting involved in what learners are doing mm -hmm. can we have a bit more activity than just uh, Eric Latte going to class and saying good morning and then the poor children are saying good morning sir mm -hmm. and then you ask them do you understand and they say yes sir even <laughs> when they have not understood a thing mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> that, that's why we are saying that is the newness mm -hmm. and um, but a key issue and this takes me back to City's question. Mm -hmm. It is the word competency that I think Kenyans have been wondering, grappling, what is yeah. this new competency? What we have done now is to decide what are these sets of, I gave you long terms, like earlier on, skills, I mean, knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values. Just let's call it competence. What are these sets mm -hmm. that we want our graduates of our school system to have? We That's where we, that's something we missed, that uh, if you think about pre-independence, uh, I'm sure City, you 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 have a, had a, a <laughs> bit more a bit more history about that. Mm. Yes, I was alive in the previous century. <laughs> Pre-colonial. Yes. <laughs> if you analyze the education we had at that time, mm. actually we had a curriculum. Mm -hmm. Yes, there was a curriculum. Yes, uh, Betty John, we has written a pencil about this called it the African traditional education. Mm. Yeah. It was basically apprentice based. You learned at the feet of people who already knew uh, what to do. Mm -hmm. And that meant something. By the time you finished the, some set of knowledge, skills, or competencies, you were able to function. Because yes. apart from just sitting at their feet yeah. and knowing what they know, yes. you were able to do what they did. Yes. Yes. And the philosophy behind it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because uh, including the proverbs you talk about, yes. you sat at the feet of people who were able to talk these proverbs, and probably were able to explain to you the context of that problem. Mm -hmm. So that when you use it later, you're not using out of context. Mm -hmm. um, then come independence time. Mm -hmm. You know, by 1964, we had all sorts of curricula in this country, mm -hmm. depending on where the missionaries who brought us education came from. Mm -hmm. if they came from Scotland, if they came from uh, uh, elsewhere, <laughs> they brought different sets of the curriculum. And remember, Ominde and his team captured it well, that our focus as a country then was to eradicate poverty, uh, uh, disease, and ignorance. Mm. But there's something else. We needed a quick labor force mm. that would replace the 
the, the, the colonialists and other people that we were sending away. Mm. So a curriculum was quickly cobbled, but Ubinde Commission put sense into it and gave us what was called the 7 4 uh, two, three. Mm. But colleagues, if I ask you here, what was this one technical name we were calling that curriculum? It didn't have a name, actually. It did have a name. But what, I, what I had the name were yeah. the exams yeah. Yeah. that you sat mm -hmm. at, at certain intervals. Yeah, those mm -hmm. were the names. Yes. But analytically, as a, I mean, an educator would tell you, yeah. it was largely a knowledge-based curriculum. Why knowledge? Nobody wanted to go into edu education that would soil their hands, if mm. you remember. You know, you needed to dress like me to yeah. demonstrate that you've gone to school. <laughs> <laughs> if you are working in Nairobi, you are yes. in some office yeah. where you have a chair and with a cup of tea and most likely yeah, you drive a car. And, and you have yeah. a newspaper. And if you came where I came from, you are able to buy a record player. <laughs> but, <laughs> you come to the village and people can listen to music. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that is an important person. <laughs> <laughs> there were only a few people and a mm. few schools mm. who went to places called technical schools. Mm. And they were not quite respected, you know. Uh, the, the, the typical definition of the people in technical school was the apron, you know. The, mm. Yeah, yeah, where I come from, they call it a name I don't want to call on, 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 on camera. Mm. But it just defines that, you know. that. So we did not have a name for it. Mm. Now come 1985, 1985. Mm. And uh, President Moi forms the Presidential Working Party on the establishment of the second uh, national university in Kenya. They did a good job. They gave us a second university, which I went to and I associate with. I'm actually a professor of Moi University. Mm -hmm. uh, we call it the, the University of the Difference. Mm -hmm. uh, we still like mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. It was the only one that was built from the scratch. But in recommending the establishment of that university, one of the gaps they identified was low transition of people to the university. Mm -hmm. So quickly they abolished the A-levels. Uh, some people used to call it the Kamodo Advanced Certificate of Elimination. <laughs> because <laughs> not many people proceeded. <laughs> then we had to do something the two years of A-levels. Mm. So we added one to the university. Mm. So from three to four years. Added one to class eight, from seven to eight years. But I want to ask you colleagues, what name did we give that curriculum? Mm. We gave it a name based on, <laughs> on the, the years, years of study. <laughs> exactly. uh, uh, yes, and we called it 844, eight, four, 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 but yeah. we did not actually name it. There was nothing descriptive about that particular yeah. system. Mm. Exactly. And mm. those are numbers. Mm. Those are just a structure. Mm. Just like now we have the competency-based curriculum, mm. but ca uh, the structure is two years of pre-primary, uh, six years of primary, and also... Uh, three years of junior school mm -hmm. three years of and three years school. of senior school mm -hmm. and there's a science behind those numbers of years which mm -hmm. maybe we shall have time to come to but the point i'm making now is that as a country we did not really think about technically because these are things which are documented they'll be written on since plato 1910 and mm -hmm. even before what is this philosophy because that name defines the philosophy of what you want analytically though from the experience that took place you'd call it a skills-based curriculum mm -hmm. Because Eight, four, if you four. remember, mm. uh, city people are supposed to leave school being able to make pots, yes, mm. uh, being able to make stools, mm. being able to make ropes. Mm. Somebody was supposed to leave that school system, being able to do something. You had a skill. Yes, you had a skill. Even sewing, yes. new running stitches, and yeah. hemming mm -hmm. stitches. And, yeah. Then yes. what did we Kenyans do? It was too much. Too much. We are, we are begging our children, yeah. you know, do things that the people have gone to school should not do. Yeah, sure. And in 10 years, mm -hmm. from 1985, actually not even 10, to 1992, KIE, which I now stay in as, as KICD, mm -hmm. was called upon, can you start changing these things? It's too much burden on our children. But there was a reason behind it. If you read McKay's report mm -hmm. that brought us 844, they actually say in their own preface, that uh, they didn't have enough time to really conceptualize the curriculum. And therefore, their re re recommendations on the curriculum should not be taken very seriously. <laughs> In their own words. <laughs> and they still said grades standard 7 and standard 8 should be looked more as vocational. Because what was happening then is that we still accepted as a country something we should all be going to jail for. That there are some learners who just leave standard 8. And their education stopped there. Mm. So they were saying that they were joining the, the world of work. Mm. Anyway, cut a long story. 
uh, that was a skills base, but we watered it down. And by 1992, uh, we had just gone back to knowledge, 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 and I had dropped all those skills based yep. Yep. learning areas. Mm. And fast forward, what became important was what grade you got, how much you could recall mm. what you had learned in school. Mm. And we started carrying children shoulder high. Mm. Uh, and celebrating the 10,000, actually not even 10, who would qualify for university. I forgot about all this. Mm, everybody but else. there is something about that curriculum. Hence the newness. Mm. It was so rigid. For you to pass that curriculum up to university, you have to be good in at least five subjects where you get B. Mm. Mm. And if you got anything less than B, English, mathematics, Kiswahili, Kiswahili. two sciences, and mm. one humanity. Mm. So it doesn't matter that you are wired to be an artist. Mm. That's your problem. Yes. You must it didn't have two matter sciences. that, you are like me, mm. you are a language person. If, if, you go, if I had gone to school during it, I don't think I would have been where I am now. <laughs> it didn't matter that uh, <laughs> you look at yourself and you were more of a STEM person. You are a science person. You still had to pass the languages and, and pass language. them well. Mm. So one of the new things that this curriculum has brought on board is flexibility. Can we give learners an opportunity to pursue that in which they have demonstrated potential, in which they have demonstrated competencies based on the continuous assessment, not a one-off paper that you do when you are sick and you are gone. So, bring it where we are, this is the first time, uh, City, that this country sat down to say, look, we now need a curriculum that we can give a name. Around we we need to identify the set of computers that will take us to, mm. to look at my level today, vision twenty thirty, mm. and it didn't come from a vacuum. President Waikibaki formed a, a task force mm. to align the Kenyan education system to the Constitution twenty ten, led by one of the most celebrated professors in this country, Douglas Odhiambo, and these people had a good time to go around the country to benchmark, and they have one of the best reports you can mm. talk about. Did you know, City, that Mackay only had 16 days to go around this country to get Kenya's views? And give us the 844. I knew he had a short time, yeah. because at the time the Mackay report was coming out, I myself was a teacher. Ah. Yes, and I was also a teacher of languages, the English you language. You have taught me. The likelihood exists, yes. Mm. <laughs> 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 Let's take a break at this point. We'll continue this conversation shortly. 27 minutes to 9. <laughs> Professor Charles Ongondo is the CEO of the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development. He's the man in charge of rolling out the CBC curriculum as we progress from now the current grade 8s as they go into 9, into 10. Like that, like that. 2, 6, 3, 3. Yes. And you said there's a philosophy behind mm -hmm. the 2, the, the 6, the 3, the 3. Yes. You'll tell us about that after this break. Keep it here. We'll be back shortly. Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice right. FM, Nairobi. Tonight, our conversation with Professor Charles Ngondo, the CEO of the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development, continues. So, Prof, 2633. Three. Yes. After you've given us the history and the journey towards mm -hmm. here and mm -hmm. the the, the thinking behind, let's have a curriculum that, first of all, we can even put a name. Yes. Because the name shows the philosophy behind the mm -hmm. curriculum. Right. And then now we have the 2633. Why are they important? Why are those years important? Yes. Uh, a big name to invoke here mm. is um, somebody called uh, Cognitive Piaget. Cognitive Developmental Theory. The years have too much the developmental milestones of the children who are the targets of the learning system. Mm -hmm. So let's start with the pre-primary, where we do two years. One, we are saying the child should go to school when they are four years old. At that age, they are formed mentally, uh, physically, and socially to be able to start doing something. Mm -hmm. Interaction. And sharpening their interaction skills. Uh, because they have been at home, mm -hmm. where we call them sweet names, you know, you are my grandmother, grandfather, mm -hmm. they have not, uh, sometimes they even run away from other people. Mm -hmm. So they have to start to learn to interact with others. Yeah. But they just need two years to do that. And the only thing they need at that point is basic literacy, 
numeracy, very, very basic, just to be able to know the environment around them. Mm. Then come age uh, six, again, scientifically, and scientists uh, who have read the brain of the human being have told us at that point now, they can start engaging in another step, socialization. But uh, these are basic socialization skills. They need to know, uh, socialize the people around them, mm. socialize with the environment around them. At that time now, Eric, they know about clouds, mm. they know about the, you know, environmental control, conservation, they know about farms, they know about lakes, rivers, and so on. Cows and bulls. Yes. But that, mm. the, and then in terms of language, the child at that stage really is not yet being made into an academic. And although our society puts pressure on them, and sometimes you talk to a grade one child, you ask them what they want to do, and they tell you, I want to be a pediatrician, I want to be a neurological <laughs> engineering. <laughs> Technically, that child simply needs to be able to socialize the right environment and get sufficient introduction to formal learning. Mm. But that should not go on beyond age 11. And this, as you know, there's a sign of age 11. Age 11 now, uh, the child is beginning to have formations that transform them from being children to being adults. Mm. Uh, that's when they are getting to the famous the adolescent stage. Mm. They are getting into the most troublesome age of human life, mm. age 11 to age 15. Mm. Right? Mm. Other than the physical formations, our voices have changed. The mind changes quite electronically. <laughs> One day you want to be an engineer. The next day you want to be a, a soldier. DJ. The third day you see a chef with a good cape and you want to be one. Uh, they are telling you, I know what I'm doing. Mm. You think they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> that is a child to be separated from the fellow who is just socializing, uh, who plays and goes home and doesn't even need to worry about exams. Mm. That's why I've introduced junior school. Mm. At that time, the only way you can manage this child is expose them to a broad-based curriculum where they do a little of everything before they can make up their minds because they're not even very sure of where their interest is. In some countries, mm. they start early uh, at about grade four, mm. which would be about age eight. So that's why we introduce junior school, age 12, 13, 14, broad-based cur curriculum mm -hmm. where you expose learners to all that they may encounter and they may have interest in. Before now, they are well formed. They have stabilized. At age 15, they start to stabilize, even mentally, mm -hmm. to be able to focus on now what we call a pathway at senior school, which is another three years. And this research, John, mm -hmm. uh, long ago, the World Bank sponsored a study called um, Africa at the Crossroads. Uh, what does the Trans-Saharan Africa want in terms of education? And they said, have a longer secondary school period but divide it into two, give people time when they can have a taste of everything and then time to start to specialize in. So now, the junior school, I talked about interaction mm. for pre-primary, mm. socialization for primary. Junior school, give it one word, exploration. A curriculum that provides learners an opportunity to explore. In fact, uh, in terms of pedagogy, mm. that is all the kind of learner whom you want to listen and just partake what you are saying mm. and assess. That's the learner you give time to do things. Active. Yes, active. In fact, if you think about a grade 7 child, if you have one or one is around you, the curriculum is made in such a way that we want them to be able to do. Uh, now, then senior school, pre-career. We don't want to tell you you are serious. That's why we give them long trousers in school. <laughs> you are now a gentleman. <laughs> you are, start to think like a scientist if you are one. Mm -hmm. If you want to think, uh, go into humanities and languages, start thinking like one. And start there for reading more, mm -hmm. exploring more, doing more about that area. And then at age 12, I mean at age 18, which is consistent with where that ends, even the Kenya constitution says you are an adult, you love an identity card and you can now go to the university where you can now be in charge of, of what you want. And this, just that we don't have much time, this has been written on, if, if you take language where we uh, sit at I and most of you operate, we can take you down mm. to what a learner at age, age six is able to do with their tongue, with the back of their mouth, mm -hmm. what are they, they are able to pronounce, what is it they can't pronounce, will be able to take it to the analytical capabilities of the child. To be able to tell you, yes, we don't want this child, for example, to read a novel of more than 150 pages. Mm. 
mm. they are impatient mm. by the time they have done 50 pages they want doing something else mm. okay. yeah so the science has documented the years and uh, Douglas Odiambo in their report because this people I told you had enough time to you know read and so on says in their own words no, no we have no business keeping a child in primary school beyond uh, six years and uh, there is no reason we should then have somebody specializing at age 12 give them some time to, to try everything in fact they are the people who initially recommended we should have two six three three it is in in their document mm. but i think i want to add something else go and do your research you people are experienced uh, journalists which other country in the world keeps children in primary school for eight years up to the other day we were only three countries in the world competing people like southern sudan mm -hmm. uh, who, who have also moved on the rest of the world the highest people spend in primary school is about seven years and it is because of this scientific reasons but we are there we, we, we had that history mm. that took us there so we don't want to blame it mm. we, there was a reason people thought about it at that time but now it is time to improve that and go on to something else prof i mean i hear you and i think look on, honestly um, i think very few times have we heard it explained in this manner that this is the reason why the numbers would have been skewed a little bit here and there because it rhymes with physiological mm -hmm. psychological developments in a child and say okay fine and cognitive and cognitive mm -hmm. so skew your education mm -hmm. to how this child is developing mm -hmm. and so it makes sense yeah. my issue is yeah. how it is being delivered mm -hmm. because somebody's got to deliver it yes. there's got to be infrastructure within mm -hmm. which this thing this, the, the carriage of it mm -hmm. for me is the problem yes that how are we assuring quality mm -hmm. of the tutors and teachers mm -hmm. who are then meant to deliver this? Mm -hmm. Who, unfortunately, in a lot of cases, and I'm sure you will agree, mm -hmm. are still stuck in the era whereby mm -hmm. the only way I know you've learned is if you pass an exam. Mm -hmm. And here we are saying, I want you to be able to be active and, you know, yeah. and, we, and then <laughs> we're not even able to decipher what an active child looks like yeah. an active child is going to be told to stand in the corner and put their hands up because mm. they're making mm. noise. Mm. Meanwhile, this curriculum is asking you mm. to, to see that as something else. Yeah. So how do we deliver this thing, which in my mind is mm. brilliant, yes. but unfortunately the vanguards of the mm. delivery mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are not uh, up to scratch. Very, very, very good questions, Ndu. Uh, and this, this, these are the questions Kenyans should be asking. Um, I'll break down your question to three things. One, infrastructure. And get back to cities uh, proverb when he last visited Switzerland. Mm -hmm. From a curriculum developer's perspective, you ought to be very visionary. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the child who is in grade 7 now will leave the university somewhere around 2031, 2032. What skills, competencies do they want? Mm -hmm. Then I tell the country, we need this infrastructure. And because we live in this space, we have to appreciate that the country may not get us there in terms of infrastructure the same day mm -hmm. or even the same month. But if we don't dare tell this country that we will need a computer or a desktop or some other digital material, we will not think about it. Mm -hmm. It will only be the, the, the budget or the plan. Mm -hmm. So I have, as a curriculum developer with my team, to tell the country this is what we need. And I can tell you we are getting there. Uh, maybe we will ask the question later about materials, which, which, which is good. Mm. Um, but then the tutors. Mm. The question with the quality of teaching is because of the context the teachers found themselves in. We found ourselves in a context where, as you say correctly, what was important and which I'll be judged by and probably promoted is how far my students pass exams. Mm. As long as we refocus yeah. and say now what should be our focus and what therefore shall we be promoted on, the teachers will change. Because I'll tell you something. These teachers we produce in Kenya, I'm a teacher educator. Mm. And I've had a small stint in uh, Britain uh, to teach. The teacher is actually prepared to have one default teaching methodology, learner-centered method. Mm. And if you go to any school even now and you come across a teacher on teaching practice, 
the marks are awarded on the basis on the extent to which they have put the learner on the seat mm. and they have just become a guide by the side not a sage on stage mm. but because over time we told the teacher no 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 what matters here my friend is how you drill drill and drill and produce this yeah. and i want to tie it with what uh, one of you asked earlier we initially packaged this curriculum the way we talked about it as if we were overhauling as if we were rejecting as if we were saying everything was bad and because of that we got into an attitudinal problem where even among us kenyans people said no no then this thing is not right mm. you know it can't just wake up and say everything about it is bad so as long as we sort out the issue of exams which we have mm. we are now saying like in primary school 60 percent of what the learners will be graded upon is based on what they do continuously with the teachers projects experiments uh, activities that that it will change mm. the teacher does not need to go to college again to be totally trained because the teacher is already trained purely on learner centered pedagogy and i can tell you our teachers teach in other spaces mm. in this world uh, some of these people we, we celebrate as teaching in international schools where we take our children they are kenyan teachers <laughs> kenyan trained teachers and they know what to do yeah yeah but because the environment the context in which they're operating allows them to teach using those methodologies so i think just to assure and do here we have not appreciated as a country even how much infrastructure but for me let me call them educational materials mm -hmm. the correct word actually is curriculum support materials we are put into that space one of these days come into the kenya institute of curriculum development for example mm -hmm. and you'll find that we have digital materials that are not anywhere else in this uh, africa other than egypt and south africa mm -hmm. that every mm -hmm. learner can access regardless of where they are in this country mm -hmm. in any learning area and we'll take them through step by step way of learning mm -hmm. uh, this country has made an effort as as anybody else would start in making a learning text in every subject for every learner so if your child in a public school today at grade eight they will have 14 books that they are exposed to yeah. and the books have been made in such a way mm. that they promote hands-on learner-centered learning mm. and we are now saying beyond the books now mm. can we get to a point where uh, learners because the digital you know revolution is with us here now mm -hmm. now are able to do things like let me just give you a quick example and then i shut up a mobile laboratory no sorry a virtual laboratory can we now say that learners can sit anywhere and virtually be able to to, to conduct yeah, experiments mm. be able to dismantle a computer mm. virtually mm. and be able to start learning about why does this part do here be able to dismantle the human heart virtually or whatever other experiment that they are able to do mm. be, uh, if, if we cannot do the physical one which we have been concentrating on you know we are still thinking about which school has which laboratory and so on but the digital space has told us this is possible and this is one of the things that kicd and the ministry of education is working towards mm. uh, so that then uh, if we can't buy the hardcore material we still give the learner an opportunity to be able to manipulate their environment and that's where the world, uh, the rest so of world we can is. all access it exactly <coughs> prof there's been this huge 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 concern yes that one of the things that this the rollout of cbc is doing is it's <coughs> supporting those in the publishing industry mm -hmm. that you know because now when you go into grade seven you're required to have x number of books you just talked about like 13 books and those 13 books by the time you're getting to term three you need an, another set of do you how many books you go to grade eight different ones you can't even hand down this 13 books that you used in grade seven to the next grade seven because there'll be different ones mm -hmm. what do you say to that is kicd yeah. changing the books that are required <laughs> too often too regularly you know what i'm, I'm very happy with uh, this invitation because you've given me a moment to clarify uh, some of these myths one like now the children are in grade eight uh the his excellency the president ruto as you know formed a presidential working party on education reforms mm -hmm. and they went around the country we listened to them you you gave them airtime one of the things they said was that uh, the parents were already complaining as we did earlier on that there were too many learning areas and mm. the bugs were heavy again with the books and so on 
Uh, as that was happening, the institute, of course, through a multi-agency arrangement, had already conceptualized that junior school would have 14 learning areas. We had already procured books, and the books, once procured, the lifetime of a book is five years. So when we buy a book, much as we say we are buying for the learner, it stays at school mm -hmm. for the next five years. Mm -hmm. But then, the presidential working party said two things. One, rationalize the learning areas. The word sometimes Kenyans have used is reduce. We are mm -hmm. not reducing. <laughs> rationalize. That means, look back at that science. You have another learning area called health education. You have another one called life skills. And see if you can integrate so that we don't have on paper too many learning areas. Okay. Now, what that means is that it calls for another set of books. But what the government has done is, we are saying, no, what we shall do is review the curriculum design. But the books we have out there already will still serve. And I'll give you three examples. We have a learning area now that we call creative arts. We have put together uh, physical education and sports, mm -hmm. aspects of it. Uh, fine arts, or what was called visual arts and performing arts. Mm. The books are out there in those learning areas. But we are saying we shall have a curriculum design so that teachers that can draw content from these books when it's necessary. So, a book, to clarify, once bought by the government has a lifespan of five years. In fact, right now, the Minister of Education has authorized us to call for books for grade one, two, three and four, which we last supplied in 2019. 2019. Mm -hmm. And the teachers have reported, you know, those are children. Books are torn, they, they are worn out, and so on. Prof, let me just get you right. Yes. What <coughs> you're saying is that <coughs> the physical life span of a book, yeah. five years. Not the yeah. content. That, yes, <coughs> book. Mm. I'll go back there. It coincides with the the, the technical <coughs> lifespan of our curriculum. So, yes, after four years, the book is torn and we won out, but it is also time to look at that content and think whether there are certain adjustments that need to make. And that's a UNESCO rule, that every country after five years, you need to relook at your curriculum and your curriculum support materials and review them. So that fact functions for us. Why yeah. five years? Five Why years. not six? Why not three? Uh, well, this is research, based on research uh, worldwide. And uh, a study done by UNESCO far back in 2005 uh, analyzed and said, generally speaking, in five years there has been sufficient change in uh, global, historical, developmental uh, spaces to warrant a relook at the curriculum. I'm in agreement. <coughs> yes. Does it then not mean that when you have books, yeah. you should have a second edition of the book as opposed to a new book? Exactly. Actually, you have got it well. Maybe I didn't miss the word. We are not necessarily saying we want a totally new book. What we are calling for is uh, a revision of that book. It's a new edition. But now, mm. for uh, people who work in our space, mm. if, if you just lazily say uh, city publishers, mm. You did for us uh, science for grade four. Mm. Just give us a new edition. You can guess what will happen. <laughs> so make it competitive. Because what KICD does, mm. when these teachers or publishers submit these books, mm. we, we form panels. Mm. One book is looked at by 15 people from different parts of the country who have not known one another. They don't know the book they are looking at. It is completely anonymous. One day I'll invite you to look at the manuscripts that we have. And you read it as an individual, mm -hmm. as an expert, and say, I've given this book 50 marks against a criterion. The five of you, five at any one time, come together and start a discussion. Why are you giving this book 90? Why are you giving it 80? And so on. Then another five people will look at it. So it's a, you know, a chain. Mm. So finally we say, these are the best books. And then when you have arrived at the books, we have met the threshold. And our threshold is very high. A book has to achieve at least 70% wow. to qualify for the next stage, which is a financial bid. Mm. And that's where your question of whether we are making publishers rich comes in. Mm -hmm. It is purely a procurement law now, the lowest bidder. Once you've met the threshold, 
Then we say now, submit your financial bid. Mm. And we'll go for the lowest bidder. Mm. And I'll give you an example. Just go out of this studio today in the so-called open market and ask for a grade 7 English language book in the market. Mm. They'll probably tell you it's about 700 shillings or maybe 800. And then ask me how much the government is buying that same book. That same book. Everything is the same mm. for the public schools. How much? 300 shillings. Oh. How yes. many books is the government buying at a go? Uh, about 1.2 million. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, because somebody says, I have never heard this new system explained so well. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing that. Allow me to say just one thing, mm. because it's critical confusion there. Mm. And I think one of the things you asked me to say, officially, as far as I'm concerned, and uh, I think I listen to my CS and my PS every day, mm. grade 9 is still housed within the primary school spaces alongside grade 7 and 8. So there is no eight, official nine. position mm. as is being peddled out here that grade 9 is going to secondary school. Somebody asked me that as I was coming here that you are going to Spice FM. Can you clarify? And I needed to say that for the sake of my constituency. So <laughs> ten, 10 is where you move? Senior school. To senior school. Yes. To seven, secondary eight, school. 9 is junior school. In fact, we no longer call it junior secondary. It's just junior, junior school. school. Mm. Yeah. So schools have to start building that classroom. Yeah, no, the government will. Okay. Yeah, uh, well, unless they are private schools. Sawa. Thank you very much. <laughs> 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 Professor Charles Sangondo is the CEO of the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development. He's been our guest. Thank you very much for, for, for joining us.